Good morning, Holiness family. It is so good to be in the house of the Lord, yes? This morning, the Holy Spirit will have us conduct interviews with individuals who are probably older than all of us put together. According to gotquestions.org, if you are counting from when the Bible was first started to be written, the Bible is over 3,400 years old. But if we measure from when the Bible was completed, the Bible is over 1,900 years old. And this morning, we are going to meet with some of the individuals who are based on what happened in biblical times, will have some advice for us with our walk with the Lord. Amen? Of course, it would be impossible to meet with them all. And we may not hear from some of the big icons in the Bible, which is good, because God's word tells us that all scripture is inspired by God, which tells us that every detail and every person mentioned will be significant, yes? My family in Christ, the Lord will have us use these beautiful minds that he gave us this morning. We are going to be using our imagination throughout this message. These interviews are based on what is mentioned in scripture and the lessons we can learn from them. Now, most of you would be familiar with them, and I'm sure we can all learn something from them today. Now, some may have more advice for us than others, but what is important the Holy Spirit is bringing these as a reminder to us of the things that we need in our walk with the Lord. And we need to keep in mind that throughout the message and throughout the interview, the Holy Spirit is present. And he will bring any supporting scriptures that he feels necessary. Amen? Now, my brothers and sisters, we are going back over 2,000 years and I'm pleased to introduce to you this dynamic duo. Together, they led the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and towards the Promised Land. They are found in the book of Exodus. However, based on scripture, this individual would not agree with the description of dynamic. After all, when God called him for his duty, this was his response. Exodus 4.10 tells us, But Moses pleaded with the Lord, O oh Lord, I'm not very good with words. I ne I've never have been, and I'm not now. Even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied, and my words get tangled. Now, I would imagine at this time, Moses' question to us would be, what is holding us back from serving the Lord? What is stopping us from telling others about Jesus? What is it about ourselves that we don't like? Or we seem to think it's a flaw and it's holding us back in this life. Exodus 4.11 gives us the Lord's response to Moses. Then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you in what to say. My brothers and sisters, we are reminded when God calls us for duty, he will equip us with what we need, yes? Yes. Now, Paul also reminds us in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, and my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather than using clever and persuasive speeches, I relied on the power of the Holy Spirit. I did so, so you would trust not in human wisdom, but in the power of God. Amen? Amen. I asked Moses, other than God equips us, what else he would like to remind us of. Exodus 3, 4 says, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, 
Moses, Moses. We are reminded that God knows each and every one of us by name. He knows everything about us. And he knows exactly why he's calling us. He knows what he wants from us. And we are his creation. Each of us are special in God's eyes. And he loves us. Amen? Amen. Psalm 139 reminds us, verse 1, O Lord, you examine my heart and know everything about me. Verse 13 tells us, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Verse 15 says, you watch me as I was being formed in utter seclusion as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. Verse 16 says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. Verse 17, how precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. See how important we are to God? He was right there every minute, every day, in, while we were in our mother's womb. The, the scripture said, you knit me together, suggests how he took time, how important that we were, and how unique we all are. Some of us may be seeing imperfection, flaws, and the sinful past that and allowing it to hold us back in this life. But the Lord sees us, my brothers and sisters, as unique and special in our own way. He doesn't see our past. He sees what we can do through him. And he wants a relationship with us, one of interdependency. Our interdependent relationship with Christ is like a three-legged race. Our leg is tied to his, and we need to synchronize our steps with his. He leads, we follow, step by step. Amen? Amen. The right move forward is only one with Jesus Christ. Our dependency on him will take care of those imperfections that we see in ourselves. Where we are weak, he is strong. In our interdependent relationship with Christ, with our leg tied to his, it is the Lord's desire for us to be willing vessels to serve him, yes? And as a people of God, we need to include in our daily prayers a request for an appointment to serve God every day. Moses also referred to Exodus 33, 70, 11, and I'm paraphrasing, where he would take his own tent and set it up outside the camp. He called it the tabernacle of the meetings. Some translations will say the tent of the meeting. And the text mentioned that whenever Moses entered the tent, a pillar of cloud would descend and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a friend will speak to his friend. As a people of God, we are reminded of the importance of setting aside time for prayer. Setting aside a place and a time for prayer. I know you hear this all the time. But it is important that we are reminded because in these times, some of us are getting so busy, so caught up with life that we don't have the time. We find it very difficult to spend that time with Christ. This is our time to seek direction from the Lord, for him to, to tell us what he needs for us to do, not necessarily only what we want from him. Yes, it's an opportunity for us to cast our burdens onto him. This is our special bonding time with Jesus. John 15, 15 says, Jesus called us his friends. Don't we make time for our special friends? Don't we make time to, for that one-on-one -on -one bonding time? Why not do it for the most important relationship that we have? 
the most important friend that we have, Jesus Christ. Amen? Moses then referred us to Exodus 5, 1 to 2, where it says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Moses would like to remind us, as a people of God, it would not be easy. It will never be easy. Whenever we are serving God in ministry, praying for a breakthrough in our situation, or maybe for someone else, our walk in Christ overall, it would not be easy. It took 10 plagues before Pharaoh let Israel go. And even that, he sent his army again to capture them and return them to, to his kingdom. How many of us know the enemy always return? He always return. He does not give up that easy. And he will use people even the closest ones to us, painful situations or our own weaknesses to hinder our progress. And Romans 12, 12 of the Amplified reminds us, rejoice and exult in hope, be steadfast and patient in suffering and tribulation, be constant in prayer. Galatians 6, 9 reassures us, so let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. My brothers and sisters, it would not be easy, but it'll be worth it, amen? Yes. We, we now turn to Aaron for his words of wisdom. Aaron refers us to Exodus 4, 14, and 16. When God recommended Moses' older brother Aaron as a solution to Moses' problem, Moses claimed he is slow in speech. And as you know, God identified Aaron as someone who speaks well and will be the spokesman for Moses. Together, they will petition for Israel's release from bondage. And as a people of God, it's important for us to respect God's choices, decisions, and his appointments. Despite Moses' fear of speaking out for God, he was still chosen as a leader and Aaron, his older brother, to assist him. One would think, or the world is conditioned to think it's the other way around, but here it is, the older brother is the assistant, and Moses was still chosen to be the leader. We need to trust God with his decisions, my brothers and sisters. And what he has called us to do for him, for him in this kingdom. And whatever we are chosen to do, we are reminded it is equally important. It is equally important. Doesn't matter if you are the leader, wherever you are, whatever you do in ministry, together we make things work. Together we build God's kingdom. We are all important in God's eyes, no matter how we serve him. And Aaron would like, us to know, would like us to not make the same mistake that he made in being people pleasers. Don't raise your hand, but do we consider ourselves to be a people pleaser? He refers to us in Exodus 32, when people became impatient with Moses being away for so long on the Mount Sinai, and they started to make demands on Aaron, asking him to make gods that can lead them. Aaron requested they bring him, go bring him gold, and he made them a golden calf and an altar in front of the calf. This is Aaron, who is assisting Moses, huh? And this is what he does. Then he announced Tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. 
As a people of God, we must never compromise our faith to please others. Never compromise our faith to please others. It is so sad that so many leaders, so many pastors are watering down the word to please people. And the need for the feel-good messages is in demand. And it's attracting so many to these messages and to these, these, these churches. However, people-pleasing is not limited to the church. What about when we're in the company of our unbelieving family and friends? Do we chuck our godly character under the car seat and bring out the worldly behavior to impress our unbelieving family and friends? Maybe we don't want to make them feel slighted or offend them in any way. So we chuck our godly character aside. Again, as a people of God, it's dangerous for us to compromise our faith to please others. And it is so unfortunate. So many become impatient in finding a partner, a Christ-like partner. So many Christians looking for a partner. And they are impatient. God has not sent the right person for them. The church is limited. You hear all these sorts of things. So they turn to the world looking for a partner, hoping that they will be able to convert them. And again, what happens? They compromise their faith in in order to please the person. Again, people pleasers. I saw this on Facebook, and you may have seen it. Marry someone who will not only accept the call of God on your life, but will also help you fulfill it. Amen? If you find yourself in that position, continue to pray and wait on the Lord to send the right person, the right Christ-like person into your life. Our next interview takes us to Acts 18.24 of the Amplified, which tells us, there was a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, who came to Ephesus. He was cultured and eloquent man, well-versed and mighty in scriptures. However, Apollos did not know about Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. He didn't know about the Holy Spirit. He only knew what John the Baptist, he knew up to John the Baptist and what John the Baptist said about Jesus. But verse 25 tells us, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord and burning with spiritual zeal, He spoke and taught diligently and accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he was acquainted only with the baptism of John. And as a people of God, we are reminded by Apollos, we can talk to others about Jesus even with our limited knowledge. So many, so many are hindered by going out there and talking to people about Jesus because they think they're lacking so much knowledge. Don't let the knowledge hold us back as long as what we are saying that is accurate. Don't let our limited knowledge hold us back. Because as we grow in knowledge, we can share more. However, people are always interested to hear how Jesus had an impact on our lives. They are always interested to hear how he changed our lives. So instead of when we tell someone about Jesus, we start to bombard them with a set of scriptures, it overwhelms them, it intimidates them. But they will be drawn to your personal experience. 
and they will feel comfortable with you. And after a while, we can subtly bring in scriptures, amen? We need to meet people at their place of need. And sometimes some of us get so caught up in all what we know and we just want to pass it over. Sometimes pride gets in the way and it's all about telling someone how much we know and, not necessary, and, and we miss the whole point of, of what our purpose here is to draw them in to Christ, amen? Verse 26 tells us, he began to speak freely, fearlessly, and boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him with them and expounded to him the way of God more definitely and accurately. Apollos would like to remind us we must be humble and willing to learn from others. We must be willing to learn from others, regardless of our education and status. There's always room to learn more, amen? amen. Our next interview takes us to Mark 5, the man that was possessed by a demon. Mark 5, 3 and 5 tells us, this man lived in burial caves and could, could no longer be restrained even with a chain. Day and night he wandered among the burial caves in the hills, howling, cutting himself with sharp stones. The text went on to say the demon possessed man recognized Jesus when he saw him and ran to him for help. But he, as he opened his mouth, as you know, the demon spoke and asked Jesus, because he recognized Jesus, why are you interfering with me? Why are you interfering with me? And he asked not to be tortured. At this time, Jesus had already asked the evil spirit to come out of the man. When Jesus demanded the name of the spirit, he said, Legion. And it's important to note, again, I know some of you who know this, but a legion was the largest group of Roman soldiers, consisting of five to 6,000 strong. They were highly skilled and destructive. So this tells us how oppressed this man was. The spirits asked Jesus to send them into a herd of pigs nearby. And Jesus gave them permission. It was approximately 2,000 pigs. And they went into the pigs, and they plunged down the hillside and into the lake and drowned. When asked what lessons this man that was now free would like us to take from this story, he referred us to verses 18 to 20 that tells us, the man begged Jesus to go with him. And Jesus told him, no. Go to your family and tell them what I have done. However, he visited the ten towns in the region and he went telling them all what Jesus has done for him. And his question to us this morning is, how, much, how many of us are fully aware of what Jesus has saved us from? How many of us are aware of the life? Or do we take time to reflect on what our life would have been like if Jesus did not draw us to him? Are we fully aware of what he has done? Are we filled with gratitude for, for saving us from that life that we, we praise him every day for it? Are we encouraged to tell others about the life that he has saved us from? Do we give him the recognition and the praises for it? Do we give him the recognitions and praises when he delivers us from things right now? I am sure some of us would have experienced painful and detrimental situations in our lives, and Jesus saved us. How many of us tell others about it? How many of us give thanks and praises to God in prayer for those times that he has saved us. 
This free man knew what oppression Jesus delivered him from, and he just couldn't keep it to himself. What about us? Are we giving God all the glory? The second thing he would like to remind us of is the significance of the pigs mentioned in the story. The pigs tells us how important we are to Jesus. The pigs tells us how much Jesus loves us because the pigs represent a financial loss to the families that own them. This was 2,000 pigs that were lost that day. 2,000 pigs went over the hillside and into a lake. And Mark 5.17 tells us, and the crowd began pleading with Jesus, go away and leave them alone. They were afraid. What else would this man do? He just destroyed our fi financial situation. He just destroyed our finances. Two, all our pigs just went over the hill. But Jesus had an point to make. Human life is more important than Jesus than wealth. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's more important. We are more important to him than wealth. And Jesus knows sometimes some choose the pigs. These are testing times, my brothers and sisters. And some of us are placing a high priority on finances and less time serving, spending time with Christ. These times are forcing some of us to focus on the finances because times are getting so hard that we have little time to spend with Jesus. Remember the three-legged race of interdependency that I mentioned earlier? Now more than ever, now is the time we need to strap our legs onto Jesus. No more than ever. Wherever we go, whatever we do, all our decisions, we must include him. Amen? For our next interview, we looked at Mark 3.17, which tells us James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, that is, sons of thunder. These were given, they were given these nicknames, nicknames because of their fiery temperaments. These two were part of Jesus' inner circle together with Peter. And they witnessed Jesus raise Jairus' daughter from the dead. You can find that in Mark 3, 537. They witnessed Jesus' clothing turning bright white and heard him speak to Elijah and Moses on the Mount of Transfiguration. This just tells you how close they were to Jesus. And considering what these two experienced with Jesus, one would say much is expected from them, yes? However, the sons of Thunder would like to point out to us one of their finest moments with Jesus. Luke 9, 51 to 56 tells us of the opposition from the Samaritans the people of the Samaritan village did not welcome Jesus. And here is John and James' finest moments with Jesus. They would like to point out to us. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them. You do not know what man of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. How many of us, don't raise your hands, fall from grace from time to time? How many of us fall from grace? People of God, the sons of thunder, would like us to know, no matter where we are in our walk in Christ, we are a work in progress. No matter where we are, how seasoned we might think we are, we are a work in progress. 
if you are listening to this message and you're struggling with a hot temper, the sons of thunder would like to reassure you that Jesus knew of their tempers when he called them. He knew of their tempers when he called them. He knew of their tempers when, when he brought them into the inner circle. It did not stop Jesus. However, Jesus knew that the journey that he would take them, at the end, he would be, they would be transformed into humble servants of Christ. Amen? Amen. Our next interview is with King Josiah. He can be found in 2 Kings 22. Josiah was eight years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. 2 Kings 22.2 tells us Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Josiah, however, came from a line of wicked kings, as you know. His grandfather was, a, was King Manasseh. 2 Kings 21.6 tells us what this king was like. Manasseh also sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced sorcery and divination, and he consulted with mediums and psychics. He did much that was evil in the Lord's sight, arousing his anger. Josiah's father also was a wicked king, King Amon. It is recorded in the Bible that Amon followed his father's monastery footsteps with evil practices. Just by Josiah's choices to do what was right with the Lord, he is telling us that we too can choose not to allow our past to dictate our future. Yes, sir. Amen. Our parents, our surroundings, we do not have to adopt the behavior if it is not a godly behavior. We can choose to not follow the crowd to do wrong and stand our ground to do what is right. If our loved ones want to walk down the wrong road, it doesn't mean that we have to follow. But when we stand up for Christ and do the right thing and follow him, he will give us the strength, the strength that is needed to endure, the strength that will be needed to, to endure and, and face the resistance that we will be getting. Amen? Amen. Our next interview, a familiar one to all, comes from the book of Judges. Judges 13, 3, 4 tells us, the angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and said, even though you have been unable to have children, you will soon become pregnant and give birth to a son. So be careful, you must not drink wine or any alcohol other alcoholic drink, nor eat any forbidden food. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and his hair must never be cut. For he will be dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth, and he will begin to rescue Israel from the Philistines. Samson was born a Nazarite, meaning he was separated and set aside for God. Samson was known for his great strength, as you know. And Judges 14, 6 tells us he ripped the jaws of the lions with his bare hands. However, Samson's greatest flaw was his weakness for women. Judge, Judges 16 tells us Samson went to the Philistine towns of Gaza and spent the night with a prostitute. This is certainly not what you would expect from a man that is set aside for God, yes. And this was only one example. However, Samson's lustful eyes took him down a deadly path when he met a beautiful Philistine named Delilah. And most of us are familiar with this story. Delilah was paid to find out the secret of Samson's strength. Skillful Delilah was able to get Samson to bear his treasured secret. Dangerous pillow talk for Samson. 
Judges 16, 17 tells us, finally, Samson, his secret with whom my hair has never been cut, he confessed. For I was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from birth. If my head was shaved, my strength would leave me, and I would become as weak as anyone else. Samson's head was shaved while he was asleep with his head on Delilah's lap. And the Philistines enslaved Samson and gorged out his eyes. What would Samson like to tell us in this interview? And as a people of God, having one foot in the world is playing with fire. As a people of God, having one foot in the world is playing with fire. Living a double life will have consequences. Young ones, we need to listen to our parents. Judges 14 tells us Samson's mother and father objected to him marrying the Philistine from Tamar. And that turned out to be a disaster and he didn't learn from that, he went again. And he made the same mistake again. However, this one was deadly with Delilah. And based on Samson's experience, Matthew 5, 29, 30 tells us how serious we must treat sin in our lives. It says, so if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gorge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your strong hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. This shows the seriousness of the sin in our lives. And Samson experienced experience this. And our last piece of advice from Samson, as a people of God, no matter what sinful situation we find ourselves in, whatever situation that we find ourselves in, throw ourselves to the mercy of God. We serve a merciful and compassionate God who is willing to forgive. So instead of running away and distancing ourselves, move closer to God, hold on to him. Because Samson did that, huh? and God gave him the strength to kill more Philistines than he ever did in his life. Samson, with his imperfections, my brothers and sisters, along with many others, are found in Hebrews 11, the great examples of faith. Yeah. We can read, you can read about it. A lot of us will be familiar with it. As a people of God, these men and women listed as great examples of faith, they were not perfect. They were not perfect and they made mistakes. But they were faithful to God. They were faithful to God. Let us, my brothers and sisters, in our walk with the Lord, not allow the enemy to discourage us when we make mistakes. This is when the enemy will tell us how terrible we are. We, we should not be serving Christ. This is when he's going to tell us we are not worthy. We are not worthy to be walking with the, with the Lord. Therefore, we shall leave. So many have backslidden because they refuse to come back to God because they, they are full of grief and guilt because of what they have done. Some of, us do, some of them don't even want to face us. 
But it's important for us to know that we will make mistakes. But the important thing is that we ask for forgiveness, repent, hold on to Christ, and change our lives. And most importantly, don't do like Samson. Don't repeat the same mistakes. My brothers and sisters, hold on tightly to Christ no matter what. When we fall, get right back up. And always, always turn back to Christ no matter what. Remember the three-legged race. Hold on tightly to the Lord and remember, in this walk with Christ, we are always a work in progress. Amen? Amen. May God bless you richly. Please stand.
one of the observations I made once when I went and looked at a potter at work is that the clay submits itself. The clay has no opinion on what is going to happen. Hmm? This message this morning, very sobering. All of the different examples that we saw pointed to one thing. We have to submit ourselves into the hand of the potter so that he would fashion us into what we are supposed to be. And even sometimes when we're flawed along the way, submit ourselves so that he can break us up and refit us and remake us into something that's fit for his kingdom. Did God minister to us today? You may have your seats. I'm gonna see you.